thank you to the fantastic person that donated this blood for me. I'm so, so blessed to have it, and it really means the world, and it's my life, so thank you. It is so important to receive blood from a similar ethnic background. And the reason that it's so important is because when you are in need of a blood transfusion, you're gonna be blood typed similarly. So me being African American, I have the best chance of receiving blood and not getting a rejection and not having a reaction to somebody that's got similar ethnicity as mine. So since I'm African American, it would be great for me to receive blood from someone that's also African American. It reduces the chance of a blood reaction or your body rejecting that blood. Without many African American blood donors, people like myself, people with sickle cell, would not be here. It's just as simple as that, I would not be alive. So that is why it's so important that everyone from every race background, every ethnicity donates blood. Thank you so, so much for giving that gift. So I think I'm a little bit different from other people where they might see a walk in the park as just that, it's a walk in the park, but I see it as such a gift and a blessing and a joy and I just want to just like savor every single bit of it and treasure it because I don't know when I'll be able to do it again. I don't know when I'll be in the hospital. I don't know when I'll be having another surgery. So while I'm well, I want to make the most of life.
the shout of the Lord. Let the shout of the Lord rise among us. Let the shout of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the shout of the Lord. Let the shout of the Lord rise among us. Let the shout of
while you're standing, I'm going to read 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 30, excuse me, verses 31, and we'll land at verse 40. <coughs> excuse me. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his, its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. <clears throat> Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be, be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and a sling was in his hand. And he drew near the Philistine. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers of his word. Let us pray. Eternal God, I save you, we thank you now. Thank you so much for your invitation, Lord God. You've had your arms outstretched all day telling us to come, and so we come. We accept your invitation. We ask that you would meet us at our pointed need, that you would be God in this place. Oh God, I lift up our speaker for tonight. I ask that you will look on Minister Goodwine, that you will anoint her afresh and anew. Use her in all that you have to say to us and let us receive what you have to say and we thank you for it lord god give her fill her with your power your energy your strength and your might in jesus name is our prayer and we give thanks amen, amen. you're now in the hands of dr bradley and the praise team how many have been trusting in the lord all day long that's all you come on how many know all of you all that are trusting in God, just lift your hands, even at home. How many know he'll fight your battles? How many know he'll never leave you, nor forsake you? Grandma said, I will trust in the Lord until I die. Right at home, worshipers right in the sanctuary, I invite you just to lift both your hands. Just lift, I invite you to lift both your hands. And just tell the Lord, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe you. There's nobody like you. Nobody above you, God. I trust you with my finances. I trust you with my health. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my life. I will trust you, God. You promise never to leave me nor forsake us. Hallelujah. I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you if you will only trust me. Trust. Try. 
going to help us say that. Trust me.
the Lord will perfect that concerning me sooner or later turn in my favor sooner or later turn in my favor sooner or later sooner or later turn in my favor if you will only trust That'll be good if that was for me, but come on and bless the Lord in here tonight. We've made it to another Wednesday. That alone is enough to bless God in here tonight. Amen, amen, amen. I count it all joy to be able to stand at the sacred desk again before you, my brothers and sisters in Christ here in person and to the West Side Worldwide family. I am just glad to be here because day to day, the songwriter said time is filled with swift transition. And just like that, that could have been our final time being able to worship God. So just being able to have another opportunity to thank him, that's always gonna be my posture. Amen. I'd ask that you stand with me briefly. Minister Bayri, I thank you for reading my scriptural text tonight. I'm just going to revisit uh, two verses and move forward. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Will you pray with me? God, we take a moment before your word comes forth just to acknowledge your presence where we are. We may not all be gathered in the same space, but Lord, your same spirit that is here is with each and every person that is watching on our various platforms this evening. So God, we ask that you show up where we are and show up in a way that only you can do. God, I've come to this preaching and teaching moment filled with gratitude and filled with thanksgiving. Lord, you've been good to us, and now we want to hear what you have to say. Lord, we've watched the news and we know what the news has to say. We, we know what social media has to say. We know, oh God, what the world has to say. But now we are here because we need to know what does God have to say. Lord, God, speak to us. And when you speak, Lord, we will listen. And now, Lord, as your humble servant, Lord, I'm asking that you would now empty me of me and fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Saturate the hearts of your people, Lord. I pray for clarity of thought, Lord, and precision of speech that I might clearly and effectively declare your glorious gospel that has the power to save our souls. Speak, Lord, like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own armor. But David said, I cannot go in these. I'm not used to them. So he took them off. For just a few moments, family, I want to preach from the thought, who is this imposter? Who is this imposter? Maya Angelou, Albert Einstein, 
Lupita Nyong'o, Serena Williams, Tom Hanks, Lady Gaga, Sona, Sonia Sotomayor, in addition to being high achieving and extremely successful exemplary leaders in their respective fields, there's one more thing that all of these individuals have in common. They all have struggled with and suffered from what has come to be known as imposter phenomenon. Imposter phenomena is a term that derives from a study conducted in 1978 by two psychologists, Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes. And essentially, what Clance and Imes conclude is that people struggling from imposter phenomena have convinced themselves that they do not deserve the success that they have. Despite their high achievements, despite all of their accomplishments, there is this internal voice that tells them that they are not good enough, that they are not smart enough, and that somehow they were able to get to where they are, not because they were competent and not because they were capable, but because of some fluke in the system. The late great poet and activist Maya Angelou put it like this. She said, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they are going to find me out now. I've run a game on everybody. They're going to find me out. That's what Maya Angelou told us. And I believe that she perfectly captures what people suffering from imposter phenomena think and believe. Not only do they think and feel that they don't deserve what they have, but they also live with the persistent fear that one day they will be found out. At some point, somewhere, someone is going to realize that they don't belong here. They are fraud, they are phony, they've been faking it the whole time. People who struggle with imposter phenomena are constantly looking over their shoulder, trying to figure out when is everyone going to realize that I, I don't belong here, that I'm just an imposter. According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, an estimated 70% of the population will experience imposter phenomena at some point in their life. 70%. That's 70% of the population that doesn't feel worthy of their success. That's 70% of the population that don't believe that they've rightfully earned all that they have. 70% of the population is looking over their shoulder, waiting and wondering, when is someone going to figure out that I don't belong here? 70%. And you know what else, family? Let me take this another step further. This phenomena hits different, or let me say, it hits harder when you're a person of color. See, studies have shown that imposter phenomena is more prevalent in communities of color. And ask me why. Well, it's easy. I'm going to give it to you right here. Because, see, for us, imposter phenomena isn't just some internal voice telling us that we don't belong. It's not just this internal voice making us feel like we're not good enough. It's, this, it's, it's the fact that there's already an external voice designed to make us feel like we don't belong. Every single day, there's some sort of message or act that would attempt to tell us that we're not good enough. Some of you might have grown up like me where you're feeling the pressure of having to work twice as hard only to be considered half as good. Every day, the external voices of the world wants us to feel as if we don't belong. That's the message we get. It shows up in our jobs, it, it shows up in schools, it shows up in our relationship, it shows up when, we, when there's a new opportunity that presents itself, it even shows up in church. But what I've come to share with you tonight is that you don't have to walk through life feeling like an imposter. If you have been a member of the Imposters Club, I've come here to tell you to cancel your subscription. Go ahead and tell yourself that I belong here. Go ahead and put your hand on your chest and tell yourself, I belong here. I, I'm not an imposter. I'm good enough. I belong here. I believe that our scriptural reading this evening provides us with lessons that we need to overcome the imposter phenomena. Let me share with you these three important takeaways that you can start doing right now, and I'll bid you good night and the Lord be with you. Our text tells us that after David was anointed as king in chapter 16, we learn that Israel is at war with the Philistines here in chapter 17. 
David is not fighting in the war. We know that David is a shepherd, not a soldier. But his three older brothers are fighting in the war. So David's father, Jesse, sends him to the battleground with an assignment. David's assignment was real simple, y'all. All he had to do was go bring his brothers some food, find out how they were doing, and take his tail back on home. His assignment was simple. David gets to the battlefield, delivers the chicken to his brothers, but instead of going back home, David decided to stick around. David decides to start asking some questions, and what David learns is that there's one Philistine who has intimidated the entire Israelite army. His name was Goliath. And the Bible says that he was six cubits and a span, which means that Goliath was about 10 feet tall. Every day, Goliath would come out and taunt the Israel, Israelite army. One day he came out and said, look, just, just send me your best man. Just send me your best soldier. And he made a deal with Israel. Goliath said, listen, if your best soldier kills me, then the Philistines will become your subjects. But if I kill your best soldier, then you will become our subjects. So let me put this in the context for you. This is not a traditional war. This is not the head-to-head -head combat that we are accustomed to seeing in Scripture. All Israel had to do was send one. All Israel had to do was send one man, one soldier, out to fight against Goliath. But nobody wanted to do it. Every soldier in the Israelite army was intimidated. Everybody was hiding. Nobody wanted that smoke with Goliath. Then David shows up. David shows up and he finds out what's happening. And do you know what David says? David says, I'll go. David says, I'll go. David says, I want all the smoke, Goliath. And, and just in case you missed it, because see, I don't want you to miss your shout because see, the shout is so much better when you understand the context. So let me break it down for you. See, David is young. The text says that he's about 15 years old. He has no combat training. He has no military experience. As a matter of fact, David wasn't even supposed to be at the battleground. David has every reason to feel like an imposter. But the text says that when an opportunity presented itself, David didn't shrink. David said, I'll go. For those of us who might suffer with imposter phenomena, that right there would be hard for us. See, this right here would be difficult for us because when we're presented with a new opportunity, even if we feel like we can do it, even if we know we can do a good job, we will still find ways to shrink and we'll start to talk ourselves out of it. We'll start to say things like, oh, I'm not qualified or, or I, I, I don't have the experience or so-and-so would be better, much, do a much better job than me. The imposter voice is real. Is there anybody out here tonight that can be honest and say, Minister Rhea, I, I know what you're talking about. That imposter voice is real, but I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the people who might struggle with imposter phenomena, but show up anyway. I just want to clap for the people who struggle with depression and anxiety and they step up anyway. I want to release the confetti for those that are being hit with various slugs of life and they still push and press through to execute the assignment on their lives. I, I just want to holler at the people that hear the voice telling them that you're not good enough, you're, you're not worthy enough, and you don't have what it takes, but you step up and you say, I'll go anyway. Come on and clap for yourself because, see, I want you to clap for yourself because showing up is just half of the battle. I want you to clap for yourself because stepping up is just half of the battle. If you have imposter phenomena but you apply to the school anyway, clap for yourself. If you have experienced imposter phenomena and in interview for that promotion anyway, Go ahead and clap for yourself. If you have experienced imposter phenomena, but you use your gift anyway, go ahead and clap for yourself. As a matter of fact, and look at somebody in here and tell them, clap for me, because I want you to overcome this thing. We've got to show up, and we've got to step up. And even when we feel like we don't belong here, we have to be like David and say, I'll go. And once we get there, Wherever there is for you, 
I need you to be reminded of these three things. I want you to remember your process. I want you to remember your process. Once David decided that he would go and fight Goliath, King Saul summoned him. When David shares with Saul that he wants to go out and fight against this Philistine, Saul says, say, man, you, you can't go out against that Philistine. He has been a warrior from his youth. He is an OG. Goliath was trained for this. He worked for this. He has the experience for this. David, you just showed up with chicken and drink five minutes ago. How do you possibly think that you're going to compete? Do, do any of you have any saws in your life or had some saws in your life? I mean, they tried to talk you out of what you knew you were called to do. Let me tell you, every now and then you might come across some folks that will try to discredit you or disqualify you or discount you and make you feel like you can't compete or get the job done simply because we didn't take the traditional route to get to where we are. David didn't get to the battlefield simply because of his training. Nah, see, David didn't get to the battlefield because he could bench press 425 easily. No, he got to the battlefield because Jesse, his father, gave him an assignment. And Jesse's assignment was what brought him there. But when he got there, he realized that Jesse's assignment wasn't the only assignment on the agenda. When he got there, he realized that there was God's assignment. You see, Jesse needed David to deliver the food, but God needed David to deliver Israel. Listen, you you might not have arrived at the place you are the traditional way, but that doesn't mean that you don't belong here. You, you're, you're not an imposter. You are right where you need to be. You may, not have, you may have gotten there a different way, but it's only because God has something different for you to do. Allow me to remind you again that the war between the Israelites and the Philistines was not a traditional war. God did not raise up a traditional soldier. It's the same thing with you and I. Maybe God didn't bring us the traditional way because God didn't need traditional. He didn't need conventional. God didn't need what had been done in previous wars or battles. Maybe God took us through a different process because God has di a different assignment for our lives. Listen, if God is going to personally take the time to craft the route specifically for you, if God is going to take the time to create a different process for you, then certainly you will when you get to where you are, it's because God wants you right where you are. There was no fluke in the system. You are right where God has called you to be. And, and, and see, God brought you that way because there's a giant that only you can slay. Don't shrink. You've got some giants that you've got to slay. The second thing I want you to be reminded of is to remember your past successes. Remember your past success. Remember your process, but also remember your past success. David may have been young. David may not have had all the combat and military training that the others had, but David did have past success under his belt. As a shepherd, it was David's job to protect his flock against lions and bears. And whenever a lion or bear would come to attack his sheep, David would strike it down and kill it. So when Saul questions David and, and rolls up on him and says, what makes you think that you can go against a warrior like Goliath? David has a response already for Saul. David reminds himself and Saul that this, this is not my first battle. This is not the first time that I've had to fight. You see, I've got some success under my belt. I've, I've got some success in my past. And let me tell you something else, Saul. What worked for me back then will work for me right now because the same God that was with me back then is the same God that is with me right now. Family, it's annoying the way this imposter phenomenon rolls up and wants to ask, who do we think we are? It has a way of showing up to ask you, who do you think you are trying to start that business? Who do you think you are going back to school? Or who do you think you are applying for the promotion? Or who do you think you are moving into that neighborhood? Who do you think you are? And when you are faced with that question, remind yourself of your past success. 
Remember that this is not your first rodeo, boo. Remind yourself that you are not new to this, but you're true to this. Uh, this is not your first giant that you've had to overcome. Take a moment to simply look back over your life and look at all that God has done for you. See, see, see me, I lost my parents at a young age, but I'm still here. Single teen mom, but I'm still here. I relocated to a place I had never been, but I'm still here. Stay Stage three cancer rolled up on me five days before I gave birth to my daughter. Intense chemotherapy, radiation, 100% hair loss. I slayed that giant and I'm still here. So when the souls show up in your life, remember what, how far you've come. Remember that this is not your first challenge. Plant your feet, stand up tall, and remember who you are. And above all, remember whose you are. This is not not your first battle and know what worked for you back then will work for you again because the same God that was with me through the last 39 years is the same God that is with me while I roll up on 40. The final thing that I want you to remember is I want you to remember what God has already placed in your hands. Remember what God has already placed in your hands. Saul eventually agrees to allow David to go out and fight against Goliath. But before David goes, Saul tries to dress David in his personal armor. But after walking around in Saul's armor, David is feeling real uncomfortable and real unsettled. David realizes that Saul's armor just doesn't fit him. He tells Saul, I, I can't go to into battle with your armor. He takes his staff in one hand and his sling in the other, and David chose those five smooth stones, and with what was in his hand, he goes out to fight Goliath. I want you to understand that when Saul placed his armor on David, he had great intentions. I'm, I'm sure Saul just wanted to provide some protection to David. Saul knew David was a young boy and wanted to keep him safe. But here's the thing, family. Saul's armor just didn't fit. David. And if David was going to succeed in this battle, he couldn't fight wearing somebody else's armor. Family, I hope that you're not missing this because this is a word just for you. One of the biggest lies that the imposter phenomena will tell us is that in order to succeed, we have to do it like somebody else. The biggest lie, it will have us believing that what we have is not enough. But David teaches us in the text that if we're going to be successful, if we're going to win the battle, and if we're going to slay the giant, that we can't go out and fight in somebody else's armor especially when God has already equipped us and we have what we need in our hands. Whose armor are you wearing right now? I, I, am I trying to emulate someone else or am I showing up to the battle as who God created and called me to be? David couldn't fight with Saul's armor because, one, it was tailor-made for Saul. Even though it might have brought Saul success and safety in a battle, I mean, this was probably the Gucci of armor for the king. I mean, I'm sure that it was the best of the best in that day, but it didn't fit David. Although it might have worked for Saul, it, it, it wasn't going to work for David. He probably also couldn't, fit, couldn't fight with Saul's armor because although it was top of the line fit for the king, it was probably a bit dated. It was not a traditional war, so rightfully so, the armor that was used to win the fight in a traditional battle would have been unsuccessful in this battle against Goliath. It wouldn't work for him. Finally, David couldn't fit in Saul's armor because, listen up, y'all ready for this? David didn't need it. David didn't need it. David already had everything that he needed to win this battle in his hands. Remember, he had already been anointed for this in chapter 16. When he showed up at the battle, he already had an assignment, not Jesse's assignment, God's assignment. He already had a process, not a traditional process, but God had moved some things around and God had allowed David to circumvent some things to get David to the battleground to do what God had called 
called him to do. He had already had past success, which meant that he already had the experience with taking out the enemy. It may not have looked like everybody else's, but it was the training that God put him through to get him to where he was at at that appointed time. Let me tell you, imposter phenomena tries to step to me all the time. It tries to tell me I'm not good enough or that I'm not smart enough or, or re, you can't do it. There was a fluke in the system. You, you don't belong here. And when imposter phenomena rolls up and asks me, who do you think you are? I, I tell him straight up, I, 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 it's not what I think, but it's what God says. I am so so let me encourage you today to do the same thing when it when it shows up tell him what God says concerning you tell him I am a child of the most high God I I am created in God's image I I am fearfully and wonderfully made I I am more than a conqueror I I am called because God called me I I am strong because God gives me strength I I am loved because God so loved the world I I am healed by his stripes I I am forgiven because God forgave me I I am saved because God saved me. I, I'm here because I'm right where God needs me to be. And I am who God says I am. When that imposter phenomena shows up, tell them who God says you are. Be reminded that what you have is more than enough and you don't need to do it like Sally did it and you don't need to do it like Sam did it. Don't allow that imposter, allow that imposter phenomena to make you believe that the only way for you to be successful is to show up like someone else, okay? It's your gifts, your, your personality, your talents, your process, your past success, even your peculiarities have been given to you by God and even the little you think you have, God will make it enough. God will make it seem like a lie. Y'all are looking at me a little strange so let me remind you that God allowed that small sling and that smooth rock to kill a giant. God allowed that staff in Moses' hand to part the Red Sea. God allowed those two fish and those five barley loaves to feed thousands and I'm trying to tell you family that everything you need to win this battle, everything you need to slay this giant is already in your hands. God bless you. God is able to do just what he said he would do. How many believe that tonight? He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Because he's able. Say, God is able to do. God is able to do yes. just what he said you, he would do. He's going to fulfill yeah, yeah. every promise to you. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you because he's able sing it one more time God is able to do just what he said he would do do y'all really believe that? because I do he's going to fulfill every promise every promise every promise to you don't give up on God. 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 Cause he won't. Cause he won't. Cause he won't give up on you. Because he's able. Yes, God. yes, he is. If you believe that, stand and sing that with us. Yes, God. That's my testimony. Is that your testimony? He's proven over and over and over and over and over again that he will never fail us, that he's able to do all God God is is able to do just what he said.
Hallelujah. He's able. Yes, yes. He will do just what he said he would do. Oh, bless the Lord. Did not our hearts burn within us? Minister Goodwine exalted the saints tonight. She said, who is this imposter? Imposter phenomenon. <clears throat> That's an identity crisis. Amen. But when you are in Jesus Christ, listen at what David did. I'm not going to wear your armor. That's not for me. I have a process that I've been through. The Lord has been training me for war on the backside of the desert. He voiced his successes and remembered what God put in his hands. Five smooth stones. And I got to tell you, he slayed that giant. Not only that, cut his head off. Amen. Bless the Lord. Thank you. It is my privilege to extend the invitation tonight. <clears throat> well, the invitation to what? I want to invite you, for those of you who are watching online, those of you who are in the sanctuary, I want to invite you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. We spend time trying to figure out who we are, and Jesus has opened the door for us. He said, come, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. If you're watching online and you have not made a decision for Christ, now's your opportunity to do so. Well, how can I do that? If you're in the sanctuary and you don't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins, now's the opportunity to do so. Well, how do I do that? It's simple. It's simple as ABC. Admit that I'm a sinner that I've done wrong and I need a savior. Jesus is that savior. He died for the sins of the world that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Confess with your mouth that you need him and that you believe that he is the son of the living God. And B is believe as well. Believe that as I open my mouth and confess my faults, that he's able to forgive and bring me into a saving relationship with him. It's just that simple. If you have questions, you can um, join us. You can send a text or an email to wbcchurch.org and backslash join is if you would like to place your membership with Westside. I'm going to pray a prayer to close us out. And after that, an announcement. Let us pray. Eternal God, I save you. We thank you now for who you are and what you have done. We thank you, Lord God, that we don't have to have an identity crisis for we find ourselves in you. Minister Goodwine called the roll. She said we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are beloved. And we thank you for loving us so much, Lord God, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for the remission of our sins. Father God, I ask that you will prick the heart of someone who needs to hear and to know that you still save. Draw them unto yourself, and we thank you for it. And we ask, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you would bless us now. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. Amen. My final announcement is the women's choir rehearsal is at 8.15 tonight. Govern yourselves accordingly. Go west side and bless the Lord.
I had someone tell me with sickle cell when I was much younger that the pain is so severe that you would pray to die. And um, I never wanted to believe that was true. But when I had my first crisis, oh yeah, it was very, very true. And it is just the worst pain imaginable. I depend on blood transfusions to live. Having had 600 plus blood transfusions, it is, it's a monthly thing for me right now. Every month I have critical blood counts and I'm needing two, three, four units of blood each month. And when that blood is not there, and when you're told, well, Lydia, we're, we're waiting for a donor and we can't find one. We're waiting for a match and we can't find a match for you. Um, anxious doesn't even begin to describe how you feel. You're just like, oh my goodness. Like, because you know, if you don't have that blood, if I don't get that blood, then I'm going to die. And it, it truly, truly is life or death and it's terrifying. And that moment when that nurse comes in and she's like, we got your blood. And it's like, you can finally breathe. Thank you to the fantastic person that donated this blood for me. I'm so, so blessed to have it. And it really means the world and it's my life. So thank you. It is so important to receive blood from a similar ethnic background and the reason that it's so important is because when you are in need of a blood transfusion you're going to be blood typed similarly so me being african-american i have the best chance of receiving blood and not getting a rejection and not having a reaction to somebody that's got similar ethnicity as mine. So since I'm African-American, it would be great for me to receive blood from someone that's also African-American. It reduces the chance of a blood reaction or your body rejecting that blood. Without many African-American blood donors, people like myself, people with sickle cell would not be here. It's just as simple as that, I would not be alive. So that is why it's so important that everyone from every race background, every ethnicity donates blood. Thank you so, so much for giving that gift. So I think I'm a little bit different from other people where they might see a walk in the park as just that, it's a walk in the park, but I see it as such a gift and a blessing and a joy. And I just wanna just like savor every single minute of it and treasure it because I don't know when I'll be able to do it again. I don't know when I'll be in the hospital. I don't know when I'll be having another surgery. So while I'm well, I wanna make the most of life.